Okay, ready to go. It's kind of cool to be back in Bristol here. I did a little bit of work here in the 90s, and it's changed a lot. The city's actually got really quite nice, except you've lost one of the best Indian restaurants you used to have here. It seems to have disappeared. I looked on Google last night and it says, restaurant gone. <laughs> it was unfortunate. Because <laughs> it used to be in Birmingham as well, and it's gone from there too. But I guess that's the way these things go. So what I want to talk here about is latency and in applications, sometimes we just don't respond quick enough. And if we don't respond quick enough, bad stuff kind of happens. Quite often it's like, is that communication coming to us quick enough? So in this case, did the person see the ball quick enough? Probably not, or their hands didn't react quick enough. But when we look at it from a systems perspective, there's a kind of interesting thing we need to consider. And that's if a system doesn't respond in a timely manner, it's effectively unavailable. There isn't really a difference between something that responds too late or responds really late. It's once it's too late, it's too late. So we need to respond in a timely manner. What are we gonna cover? Going to cover five things. I wanna talk about blocking and how blocking affects our applications. What do I really mean by latency? Because it's a very overloaded term. We're going to explore how locks impact your code. We're going to look at some data structures, particularly for when we're communicating. We end up using queues a lot. And I want to look at where the world's kind of going next and what have we learned over the last few decades of doing this. So let's start off. It's all about the blocking. The main point to this is we will not be making progress at times, but we've got to work out what is the thing that's stopping us from going forward. In algorithms and concurrency, we'll talk about blocking uh, facts in algorithms. What I mean by this is a thread is blocked if it can't make progress. So it can't get to do what it needs to do. It is effectively blocked. Now, locks cause blocking, but locks aren't the only way we can be blocked. We can be blocked for many other reasons, even in lock-free algorithms. There's two major causes of blocking. Kind of first up is this idea of having systematic pauses, systemic pauses in our system. So like things like we can have garbage collection. VMs come to a thing called safe point a lot. Safe points are kind of the bane of my life. If you don't do much in measuring systems, you're probably are not that aware, other than every now and again, your JVM locks up and you kind of wonder why, and then eventually it comes back again. But there's many causes of why that can happen. But it's not just VMs that do this. So if you're programming in sort of .NET or Java or pretty much any of the money's run times, you will experience GC pauses at some stage. But operating systems can pause just the same. For example, there's a thing called transparent huge pieces in Linux. It will cause you to pause at times as well, sometimes for as long as you would experience a GC pause. So sometimes we'll blame our VMs when it's not actually the VM, it's the underlying operating system. And it goes deeper than that. It can even happen in hardware itself, things like SMI, system management interrupts. I'm not gonna talk about this. It's a huge and interesting subject on its own. What I want to talk about is concurrent algorithms. So with concurrent algorithms, we're often notifying across threads. We're waiting for a completion of one thread to do something before we start doing something else. Anybody here got kids? Have you noticed that the more kids you have, the more indeterminate it is before you can get to do something? <laughs> You've got to herd these together. Well, they're a really good proxy for threads. The more threads we have in a program, the more we're trying to herd these things together the more indeterminate it will be to whenever we actually manage to do something. So how we sort of control and coordinate a lot of this becomes important. In concurrent programming, we've got lots of different things, mutual exclusion, notification, rendezvous, all that sort of stuff, but it all has interesting implications. We quite often will see people using locks. Locks are a great way to make steady, predictable progress. So if we look at the left-hand side, we come to a junction, we can have traffic lights. Can you go or can you not go? it becomes very predictable, but it's got also some kind of nasty effects Like you turn up and there's actually not much traffic there, but you have to wait anyway. You may have to wait too long for different things. So you get predictable progress, but it's sometimes not ideal. Alternatives is things like runabouts, which can work quite well. I actually was born in a place where runabouts were pioneered in the UK. They're done where I come from in Craigavon and Milton Keynes. Anybody who's been there will sort of know what it's like as well. So these things you get to know very, very well. 
But that is you can keep making progress, but you can get into states where it's very hard if everybody doesn't play very well. Like if somebody drives out onto that and stops, it becomes a real nightmare. And the same sort of things can happen in our algorithms. So they're more difficult to get right. What do I mean by latency? Let's go into this. Well, this is a lot of my life. I spend time waiting at airports, going to go through border control, and as you stand there, you get to realize what is really important about concurrent algorithms and parallel algorithms. And it's kind of a wake-up call, this is the world going forward. Not only do we have no more increases in clock speed, we're now reaching the end of Moore's Law. People are now declaring that it's, it's over. We're going to have to go parallel to get speed ups in the future, or we're going to have to get better at doing algorithms. So we've got to start thinking about some of this stuff. Well, if you look at this, you've got kind of nearly everything you need to care about from a performance perspective. We've got all these parallel lines. We've got all the different effects of queuing. We've got services happening. That from a queuing theory perspective, this is kind of perfect. Now let me go into this in a little bit more detail. What do I mean? So who here has heard of queuing theory? It's 100-year-old stuff now, going back a long time. But it's really important to the stuff that matters for us when we're programming. So if I've got a service here, and it's going to do some work, this little symbol represents a thread, and it's going to have a queue in front of it. We have the service time. So when we start breaking things down and modeling it, something needs to be serviced. In many systems, when people measure performance, they measure just service time. Anybody here use Cassandra? And in this database, when you get the performance figures out of it, they're giving you the service time, not the real picture. Why is that not the real picture? Because you've also got the time you're waiting, or you're latent for that. That needs to be included as well. What's really important with most systems in your measuring is the overall response time. And that gives us the whole end-to-end -end picture because that's what users actually care about. If you take the measurements just inside your system, quite often you're just measuring service time. We need to get that end-to-end -end picture. We also need to consider the things have to be enqueued and dequeued. Again, it doesn't come for free. It's got a cost. And we'll see later that sometimes it's a significant cost. This graph is your kind of classic queuing theory result. So, as I increase utilization of any given service, my response time increases as a mean. How does this come about? So like, let's imagine if I'm going to use something and it takes a tenth of a second to use it. If I have things arriving at five per second, it will be 50% utilized because that's how much of the resource you're using up. So that gives you a clear probability for if those are arriving, and a reasonable distribution, you're going to end up with the probability of something being in the queue in front of you when you go to use this. So why do you get this nasty curve? So if you're 50% utilized, so we're over here, the chances are one in two that there's going to be something in the queue in front of you, so you're going to have to wait for that period of time. So it goes up. As utilization further and further increases, the probability of something being in the queue increases, and then the queue starts to form and then you end up with a very poor response time. So if you want stuff to be responsive, we've got to keep utilization low, particularly got to keep utilization below 80%. If you need a very responsive system, you want it to be significantly below that because you want plenty of headroom. So it's really simple stuff on how things end up queuing and being aware of what's going on with that. Many people may have heard of Amdahl's law. What most people haven't heard of is a thing called universal scalability law. So what is Amdahl's law? This blue curve, it shows that if I've got some piece of work and I need to speed that up, and I'm going to speed it up by going parallel, the amount of work that I can make go in parallel directly impacts the amount of speed up I can get. That blue example is where 95% of an algorithm can be made parallel. Only 5% cannot be sped up you can never get greater than a 20x speed up. If 50% was just the part that you can make parallel, you can't get better than a 2x speed up. So the bit that is your sequential constraint dominates your algorithm. That was Amdahl's argument that he was making to why we should not be using all of these new sort of mid-range computers. He wanted people to buy mainframes. 
with fast single processors. Amdahl's law was not about trying to get everybody doing parallel computing. It was completely the opposite. He wanted us to go by mainframes. He's peddling mainframes. Yet everybody thinks Amdahl's all about parallel computing. But his argument was just the best case scenario. That was showing a perfect world where we could get perfect speed up at no cost. In the real world, Neil Gunther, when he was doing work at, Sp at Park Place, discovered that you never got that. You tended to get something that looked like this red line. And what he discovered was it's not just the sequential component, it's the coherence cost of making that data coherent across all parties involved. There is a latency involved. Speed of light or speed of communication becomes a serious impact in these sorts of things. So we heard about this morning about like we're looking at cloud computing, looking at Hadoop and stuff. These are the sort of results I quite often see when people are running large clusters of things where they start throwing nodes at the problem, the coherence cost starts to dominate. And then as a result, you throw more processors or more nodes at it, it gets worse rather than better. You cannot avoid this. Once you have got something that's a sequential constraint and that data then needs to be shared, you will end up being fundamentally limited. Now, what does that appear? A reduction step in a job is a really simple example of this. Mutual exclusion, locking, anything like that where you end up having the sequential component, we will be limited. You cannot run away from this math. This math will hunt you down, you will not escape, and it doesn't matter how clever you are, it will still get you. <laughs> so we have to think, how do we break our algorithms down? How do we deal with this? So, what have I been doing for the last 10 years? I've been working a lot on systems that need to go very fast generally. A lot of work in high frequency trading, messaging, big data systems that need to crunch data really quickly. You often end up communicating between different components. You end up spending a lot of time studying how do you make communication go really fast. And at the, the heart of all of that is usually queues especially when you've got many things producing data going to something that's going to consume it. We have interesting contention that appears there. Now, if we get into this and we start to study, you start seeing very quickly that the time to NQ and DQ can often become the dominant cost. And a lot of the pretty pictures in the math that you see, that's not factored in. And so we need to end up looking at that and uh, drilling down and measuring. When you start measuring, you start realizing that many things that do this with locks, the locks and the blocking effects of this is what really prevents our progress. Now, for the Java programmers in the room, this also applies to pretty much any other language that uses locks and condition variables as a means of sort of protecting our queues from mutual exclusion. So I'm just going to pick on Java as an example. In fact, Java's got some of the better implementations across other languages. It's much worse as a picture. So what's this look like if I call put or take? Underneath, I've got to use a thing called condition variables. So if you're a C programmer and I've got a POSIX background, these are POSIX condition variables. These will appear in many languages just under different names, different guises. So in Java, it'll appear as wait and notify on object. It'll appear as signal and await on the Java you told concurrent locks. In C, it appears as condition variables that have to be associated with a mutex. How costly are these? Well, what does it take if I want to have one thread notify another thread that something's available? Like, for example, I add to a queue and something's waiting to take from the queue to be notified that there's stuff to be taken, or vice versa. Like, I want to put in, but the queue's full. I need to be notified when something's removed to take it out again. Well, let's measure this. Let's set a variable, signal on that variable to another service, get it to signal back again, and measure the round trip and record all of those in a histogram. Do not go recording these sorts of things with averages because averages hide a multitude of sins. Why am I saying that? Let's look at what this looks like if you capture every single data point and we end up with a percentile distribution. You get a graph that looks something like this, where for a good chunk of the time, like 90% or so of your observations are all happening in around the sort of seven to nine microseconds range. And then it starts going wrong. But let's just pause for a second. Seven to nine microseconds. Does that sound like an incredibly tiny amount of time? This is between two threads in the same process on the same machine. Do you know that you can go faster between two different machines in a data center using a good modern network than that? This is 
woefully bad. <laughs> and these things add up really, really quickly and start dominating the cost of your time. So that's your best case, kind of, which you're getting 90%. And then look, start looking at the 99, 99.9, .9, whatever. We start getting longer and longer wait times. We start going up in the tens of microseconds. We could have multiple round trips between machines in that sort of time. And the worst case scenario on this simple test that I've done was over five milliseconds. Just the signal between two threads. And that's because the cost of doing that, getting the operating system involved in signaling between two threads, it's like getting the government to sort of arbitrate a dispute between these two kids that you're trying to get out the door. <laughs> you're back to that sort of level of complexity. It should be much, much simpler. And by the way, that's the good news. The bad news is it's much, much worse. So that's a micro benchmark running on a machine that's doing nothing else and everything's hot in cash. If you do that within a large scale application, you'll be looking at an average of around about 50 microseconds and going up into the many hundreds of milliseconds or even seconds at times on being responsive. So these locks really, really hurt. And you start realizing very quickly, you do not use those if you want to have a highly responsive or highly scalable application. You can't put these cues at the heart of what you're doing. So the interesting question is, is the non-blocking APIs any better? Can they do it in a different way as for us? What do I mean by that? Offer and poll. So you go to offer to a queue. If there's no space available in the queue, it returns false straight away. You don't get tied up. You don't get blocked. You could go off and do some other work. Or you could just try again. But the thing is, you don't drop into the operating system to arbitrate that notifying using the condition variables. Similar on the poll side, you pull from the queue. If there's something there, you take it. If not, it returns null, and you can go off and do some other work. The important thing is that thinking, can you go off and do some other work? That's a whole interesting topic on its own. We so often are very synchronous. We don't think, is there other work you could do? Yet, in the real world, we have to. So as you went to round up one kid and another one's run off to do something, you really want to go after the one who's run out the door running across the road <laughs> and try and stop them. You've got to be able to do other work. We can't get tied up and blocked. Just for reference, for all of the work that's going to come after this, this was benchmarked on Java, uh, Java 8 update 60. It was running on Ubuntu in performance mode. That was a processor and stuff. So. If you want to go replicate the experiments, you can do it yourself. The benchmarks are all available on GitHub. Now, what figures do we get? So what's this big wall of numbers all about? Well, I want to test things like a red blocking queue, link blocking queue, concurrent link queue that comes with Java. I've also got a baseline. And that baseline is a variation on Lamport's uh, circular buffer queue from the 1970s. It's been augmented with some modern ideas from things like fast flow and some of the work I've been doing on other stuff, it's probably the most predictable, lowest latency inter-thread exchange mechanism I have seen. It's incredibly simple, but it's only single producer to single consumer. We want to deal with the more complex scenarios of multiple producers. Like, for example, I want to write to a log. I want to write to any sort of database or contended pool. Or if you want to do fork join or anything like that, these are all going to be contended and more complicated. So what are these figures? Well, the numbers in the prod column are the numbers of producers. That's the number of threads that are going to be producing. The mean is the mean response time we see, and the 99th percentile is given that quantile distribution. Why am I picking 99? Because as I said, I want to focus on what are the algorithmic effects and not the systemic effects. You tend to get lots of really interesting systemic effects beyond 99, which is valid piece of work to look at, but it's not relevant in the looking at this algorithm. So what are we seeing here? These are all the figures we're getting for the different types of queues that are out there. Now, in this case, what I want to do is I want to send one message to a thread and get a response back. And I won't send another one until I get a response. So I'm in a very synchronous operation style. And by taking that synchronous operation, you don't tend to contend so much on like the head or the tail of the queue. Real world is you tend to burst. So you get a burst of messages in. You have to handle the burst and then respond. So in this case, what I'm going to do is bursting in with 100 messages, trying to deal with them as quickly as possible as they're contending on the queue and getting a response back. These are the figures that we end up getting. What's interesting in here 
is look at the 99 percentile for a rev blocking queue and link blocking queue. We're looking at 90 to 180 microseconds. That is like many trips across the data center. And that is just the send between two threads in the same process using the queues that come in the standard JDK. Note that it's a lot better when you go down to concurrent link queue. So what I'm going to do from here forward is use concurrent link queue, and that will become the baseline that we'll compare other things to. So this uses lock-free techniques. The top two are using locks. And this is where locks start to show what their issues are, even when you're using them in a non-blocking fashion. So you're not using the condition variables, but you're having to have the mutual exclusion applied to the head and tail of the queue. As I worked on systems 10 plus years ago, I kind of went through and made this sort of discovery. So I discovered we've got to be using better implementations of queues. This was dominating the time in the systems I was working on, but I ended up with another interesting set of discoveries is the queues that I got in the JDK weren't suitable for real world examples. Now, what do I mean by not suitable? They don't have a size method on them that you can call to find out how big your queue is without impacting the performance of the queue. They use locks. So the same lock that you have for the head and tail of the queue is used for the size. That means if you read the size, you, you block the flow of the queue itself. That is not a good place to be. That will slow you down. There's nothing that will tell you flow rates through it. You can say how many messages have gone through in the last minute, in the last hour, in the last whatever unit of time you want. They generate a lot of garbage, and they also don't things like fan out to different ways of working. So like, I want to take a message, I want to send it to this thread, and this thread, and this thread. You can not do those sort of multicast style semantics. So you end up just being limited with what's in there. There's lots of other things I could go on about, but they're kind of interesting, almost academic exercises that don't really work for real world applications that have got pipelines in them. So you end up, you have to look at other things. What are the other things that are out there that are interesting? So first of all, let's start off with, FIFO, so I mean first in, first out, examples that work between two threads in the same process. One of the early pieces of work we put out on this was the disruptor. So this is going back nearly 10 years ago, we were working on that. How does it work? Well, we wanted to get over some of the issues, like don't want to generate too much garbage, so I'll pre-allocate the memory and I'll reuse it over and over again. I don't want to use locks, so I'm going to use some lock-free techniques for dealing with this. How does the base disruptor work? It's really quite simple. So you start off, you claim a sequence. It's a variation on Lamport's work on the Beckery algorithm. So again, you find like, a lot of the stuff has all been done before. I think Adrian's going to talk about some of this later. There's some great research from the past. We just need to be aware of it. We, we, kind of, we, we don't build on the shoulders of giants in our industry. We just kind of invent everything over and over again. When there's wonderful, great work, let's, let's go forward with it. I kind of joke that, well, don't feel bad about it. We're living in the age of software alchemy. <laughs> we'll grow up in maybe 400 years and be like the way physics is now. <laughs> But what do we got? So we claim the sequence. We can use low-level atomic instructions called CAS instructions here. Let's compare and swap. So I want to swap in a 1 to that value if it's still 1. And if it is, I've got that. It's my slot. So now I've got the slot. I can convert that to the ring buffer itself that I want to use. I can then fill in the details in the little object that's been pre-allocated in the ring buffer. And then I need to update the cursor to say I'm done. Very simple three-step process. So claim the slot, work with it, update the fact that you're done. The other side of it, when the go to consumes that was producing, the consumer can see the fact that the cursor has gone forward that tells it that there's some data. It can read the data out of there and set it back again. And then it can update its own counter to say where its progress is. So everything is coordinating by just saying where it is. It's a bit like the roundabout example. We don't need traffic lights. We just observe what's going on. As long as everything's observed, it all appears in the right order. We can then take whatever actions we need to do. That was the disruptor one into disruptor two, same algorithm. At its core had this little piece of code. This was probably the, some of the most innocuous, but some of the worst code that I ever allowed to get into production. Why is it so bad? This is such simple little piece of code. So whenever we're back in the, so I produce, I claim the slot, I write in my details, I want to now let other threads know that that slot is, uh, that that work is done. 
I need to update the cursor to say it's done. So I need to do this. I need to update the claim sequence. But I can't just update that because the whole thing's working on a monotonic sequence, so the consumer needs to see that it's got a completely contiguous stream. You can get race conditions. So we've got the race condition of one thread starts the process, takes it and interrupt, another thread comes in, sort of races and finishes the process before the first one that started had done it. That's kind of natural thing that happens in concurrent programming. How do we keep everything aligned? Well, we said, what is the expected sequence we want? So whenever the slot before is complete, we can move this one along. So we're all just in a line. And as soon as you see the person behind's complete, you can say you're complete, and then it just continues onwards. Very simple code. We just end up spinning around here waiting for the one before to complete. The problem is, what if the one before took an interrupt? This thread ends up spinning in here, waiting for that thread to run again. It's now entangled. It's blocked with the thread before. The fact that this is spinning means it ties up the CPU, which means the one before doesn't get to get the CPU to this runs out of its quantum. That could be a, a quite a long time forward. These sort of things did not show up as problems for us at LMAX because we tended to run on systems where we had way more cores than we had threads that needed to run. We had a problem. We then end up we release this as open source, people start using it in the wild, and we start discovering that people start using the disruptor on machines where they want to run way more threads than they've got cores available. As a result, they end up finding all of these sort of bad bits of behavior. So we thought, what can we do to change this? Well, we took some ideas from some other work, like particularly the work on uh, fast flow, and put some of the ideas into what was the disruptor 3. What's the change in the algorithm? Very similar to before, we claim the slot that we want to use. We work with the array just like before. But then rather than update the counter that says what we've done is we just mark in an array the slot that's complete. This means that all threads can run independent and you've got a mirrored available slot along with the slot that you're working with. You're now no longer waiting on the one that's behind. The gating side of it then just needs to see the fact that that slot is available can take something out of the main ring buffer and then update its gating afterwards. It's very subtle, but it's this thing, do not entangle threads together. If you can break the entanglement, now you're not going to be subject to Amdahl's law for that part of the algorithm. And that's where Amdahl's law hunts you down, especially when it goes wrong. What does this mean for a real world system? Well, this was a client of mine who had a trading system. And what we've done is we plotted every single transaction that runs through the system over a period of time and put them on a scatter plot to see what latency looks like. What's the response time of the system looks like? And you tend to get these sorts of things. I love these. We should graph so much more of what we do because it gives you such insights into what's happening. And you get to be able to spot patterns and you realize what some of the patterns are. So this was under Disruptor 2. And we noticed that we've got the shape, we've got some interesting little things in it. We've dropped in the, the disruptor three. So the only change between uh, this plot and the next plot was changing the disruptor. Look at how latency improved. By the way, that's a log scale. So this is a major improvement in the system. So not only did it get to be a much better average response time, a lot of the outliers went away. So look at before look at after, just by changing that very simple thing. And now also, when we remove that level of noise, some of the other effects become more pronounced. We can see different things. Like notice that there's strata appearing here. Notice there's these very distinct marks. What these were, were data structures resizing, hash maps. Hash maps reach a certain size, they need to be resized to get bigger. That caused an interesting effect. As it resized, it generated a lot of garbage, caused a minor GC event just afterwards, and you get this whole snowballing. But you can start to see this. We started finding that we were walking out of different cache levels, and you can start to see, you, you can almost like, I can get to the point where I can nearly read the type of hardware people are running on by looking at these. It's, it's kind of, it's a great thing. But that's all just from, making a simple change, like that, that one loop being replaced with an array that we write into, got that big step forward. So that was the disruptor. What if you couldn't change your API? So you, you've got a queue, you need to replace it without being able to change all of the existing code. 
Well, we end up working on this many-to-one concurrent array. So what we done again, take all the work off Lamport, take some of the work on fast flow, looking at some of the other work on queues, can we come up with something that's better? And also some of the work that was done on the disruptor. We do a very similar thing. We cast forward a tail to claim a slot. This time we just put the element straight into the array. And when the other side goes to take it, it takes out the element. It can null out the array, so there's no special exchange, and then updates the head. It actually becomes simpler. It goes an even simpler algorithm because we got rid of a lot of the complexity, but we traded some of the complexity for garbage. And this is often a trade-off you get in concurrent systems. Quite often we can reduce complexity by uh, creating garbage. For that, the, the, the flip side is the garbage can cause pauses and cause all sorts of other stuff. So you end up, you have to get a GC that's really good or be good at tuning GC. So playing these games becomes an interesting thing. What do these look like from the figure's perspective? So concurrent link queue, again, as a baseline with the disruptor and the many-to-one concurrent queue. We started getting more efficiency. So in the non-contended case, we got an improvement in, in efficiency, reasonable improvement in efficiency, but not absolutely staggering in many ways. That wasn't a goal for what we we're going after. What's more interesting is let's go to the contended case. Let's go for burst traffic at this again and see what happens. Look at the standout on this is that the 99 percentile, when contended, it all kind of evens out. So even though you can come up with a more efficient, smarter way of doing something, you can get dominant factors, particularly in concurrent algorithms where you can't run away. So this was like, you cannot run away from the math. It hunts you down. Even when you're smart and you optimize stuff, and I see this a lot, is people can optimize for local maxima, but they end up, the overall thing doesn't particularly improve in some ways. So you have to look at what is the limiting factor overall and how do we deal with that? If anybody's used the disruptor, just a kind of a call out on a disclaimer on this, the disruptor has got batch methods and can run single producer to get some of the better figures, but I wanted to do a like for like comparison. So we went forward from that. We start looking at other ways of doing stuff, particularly now we're getting machines with loads and loads of cores. We tend to break things up across cores. In fact, I see a lot of times where people cope with having a number of VMs on the same machine and keep them smaller is a good way of dealing with some of the GC issues if your garbage collection can't cope with very large heaps. Have a l number of smaller heaps and have them all communicate with each other. Often people will use a many-to-one ring buffer for that. How does one of these work? Well, we allocate a big memory map file. It's shared between the processes. We write into that. We write in by casing forward a tail counter writing our message into that in serial, serialized form, putting the header on it, and we do that in a memory-ordered fashion. So when you see the header in and with a particular field, you know it's readable at that point. The consumer can read the message, copy it out, zero it, and move forward its own thing. So really simple and just go around and use them. You find that a lot of these algorithms are actually really, really simple and work very nicely. What does that look like for what actually goes in the ring buffer? For anybody who's ever worked on protocols, so we'll be used to the protocol porn that we normally do in ASCII. And we write in things like or frame lengths or message types, the encoded things that are in there. The problem with this is we end up taking a throughput hit because we've got to keep zeroing. We've always got a zero in the background. So kind of, I, I like to think that you go forward with these things is you have a position, you know what something's good for, where are the problems, how can you address them, how can you move forward? This is good engineering, you, good sciences. You look at how you can get advancements in different areas. So we try to address a lot of this, and one of the results for this was Aron IPC. Now what's different with this? Very similar again to the circular buffer idea, is we write messages into the circular buffer, moving forward a tail, they're doing the same sort of thing of writing the message, put on the header that goes on, but it's, it's, a, it's an append-only log. It's not a circular buffer. And this makes things a lot simpler from an algorithm perspective and employs a couple of new techniques that we can use. Like we can move forward the tail using a thing called the X add instruction rather than a CAS now at this stage. Because at the heart of those other ones was those spinning CAS loops. What do I mean by spinning CAS loop? Well, if I read a counter, and two threads read the counter is 
They both get to read the value. They both will do the increment, and then they both go to a conditionally write back. As you go to conditionally write back, one succeeds, one fails. The one that fails has to go around the process and do it all over again. Now, go back to Amdahl's law. The more threads you've got doing that, the larger that sequential constraint becomes. And you get a queuing effect on it. So how can you break it down? Well, with the XAD instruction on X86, you can do the read and an atomic update all in a single action. And there's no read, sort of go to do it and then fail and go around again. You break that, that link that's in there. We can do this since Java 8. So this now becomes available with some of the changes in Java 8. We're able to move that tail forward. But you end up with this whole problem about what about the file that goes on forever? And you see this a lot in academic researches. You get great work, you get great theories, and then it falls apart in the practical real world because they don't deal with real issues. With the real issues, then things like page falls, page cache churn, the pressure in the virtual memory system can cause the whole thing to lock up. How do we deal with it? Well, you take other approaches, you learn from other things. I took this idea from when I used to go backpacking. When I was backpacking, you very quickly get to the point where you travel light, you wash one, wear one, dry one. That's how you kind of get by. You don't keep going forever with stuff. And we had the idea of we keep the logs, we've got the dirty, the active, and the clean. And we have something in the background doing the cleaning, so now we no longer have the zeroing problem. We've taken the zeroing problem away. We can deal with a log that goes on forever by not having the cast, just using the X add. And so our publishers don't need to do that. You may ask, well, how does that work? Well, let's say I'm coming towards the end of a log. I'm going to take the particularly hard case. I want to move forward the tail. So one thread does the X out on it. Another thread does it at the same time. And now the tail's moved in two jumps. The way the instruction works is it gives you the value before the increment, and then it does the increment but it does it all as one action. So you know the point it was at whenever you ask for that increment. So if you're the first one that does that, you know that the offset you start at is there, and if that offset plus your length is within the range of the buffer, you're good to add. If you're the second one where you realize that your offset's within the buffer, but the length goes beyond the end of the buffer, you've tripped the end of the buffer. You have a responsibility that you have to deal with. And the responsibility for the second message is that it has to fill out the log. The, it puts a padding record in for that. It rotates to the next log and then puts its message in. No third party needed to be involved. It's a protocol of interactions that all threads agree to obli oblige by, and then it just works. As I mentioned, zeroing happens in the background, so we solve a lot of the throughput issues that are involved with that. What's this look like when we start applying it? So we are now looking at concurrent link queue against the many to one ring buffer and the IPC buffer. We start seeing that things have improved, but Aaron's actually gone a little bit back. So I showed you before we're constantly making improvement. Why has it gone a little bit back? This is the uncontended raw work case. Quite simply because the header it's putting in is the full header that's needed to go onto the network. So there's a lot of work in this just to have this available in the network. If you're interested, anyway, separately into distributed systems, Aron's core data structures are CRDTs. They allow the buffers to be replicated from one machine to another, and they deal with a lot of the networking issues, like the fact that things arrive out of order, the fact that things can be lost, they can be replayed, they can be replayed many times. It deals with all of that and puts the logs back together again. But that's, again, a much larger talk. What's more interesting is, how does this work under contention? So even with the extra work that's involved, it's kind of like comparing the sub-optimization versus getting the big, important things right. Well, first of all, you see that the off-heap ring buffer has got a lot better than concurrent link queue before. We were always dealing at the 50 plus microseconds for exchanging 100 messages. We've now come down to the 34 in this case. And also in the uncontended has got better as well. Why is that? It's because of a thing called false sharing. So our cache subsystems move data around in cache lines, which are 64 bytes at a time. They don't move words or bits. They move whole cache lines, 64 bytes at a time. Now, if you're back in the cases of using those arrays, the, the adjacent slots in the arrays are in the same cache line quite often. 
you'll typically have 16 or 32, depending on your cache line size and what type of pointers you're using, sharing the same cache line. So that's being ping-ponged between the threads all of the time. That ends up being a hidden contention. It's Almdahl's law coming to get you in a hidden form. So we have to be aware of that. Not just on the data structures, the fact that we have GC. GC, whenever it's looking for what we're, we're in the heap it needs to collect data, it needs to know which parts of it. It doesn't scan the whole heap all the time. To do that, it uses a thing called card marking, where it looks at where changes have occurred in the heap. And those cards end up representing a large part of the heap, and that card table ends up being also a case of false sharing with a lot of the references. So you can turn on things like conditional card mark. It improves a little bit. The dominant factor in this as a takeaway is actually the false sharing on the data structures itself. So how you layout your data structures in memory is now one of the most crucial things to getting good throughput. The other interesting point is this spinning cas, the fact that we got rid of it, does it actually make a difference? Well, that's the figures we're now getting. So even putting that very large header on, we have taken a major step forward, like going from like 56 microseconds to exchange 100 messages down to 13 microseconds to be able to do that. And it's really consistent. If you actually look at the higher percentiles, it gets even better because it also avoids some of the systemic issues as well that's out there. So what's this look like? I've given you a pile of numbers. Let's just put it on a good old uh, histogram for us and see. Over the last sort of 10 years, looking at different data structures for how to exchange data in a much more efficient way. We're going back to link blocking queue, going through the disruptor and down to where we are with Aaron today. And we're improving these sorts of things all the time. This is what's kind of worthwhile looking at it. Kind of an interesting question here is, if you think about it, what is logging? Logging is a messaging problem. You're sending messages to yourself in the future to find this you will be contended. I spend a lot of my life measuring other people's applications, finding out where they've got limitations. And logging is usually one of the biggest limitations to scalability around, and it's becoming more significant by the day. As we get more cores in our machines, it becomes the sequential component that is slowing everything down, and people often don't think about it. If there's one takeaway you take from today, think carefully about how you set your loggers up. If you're using your normal synchronous appenders, you're going to keep me and others in jobs for a long time. <laughs> because all the great work you'll do elsewhere to make your application scalable, when you put them on the high core count machines, it will get slow to a crawl. So you're better off making sure you can do this in a reasonably fast way. So quickly, where can we go next? We've been doing a lot of work on the C versus Java side. How do they compare? The C++ is faster than Java. We've been implementing these algorithms in both. Some of the stuff that's holding us up, particularly spin weight loops. On x86 these days, whenever you're spinning waiting on a change, one of the most important things you can do is call the pause instruction. We can't currently get at this in Java. There's a proposal going into Java 9 to be able to get at this. It's going to be on thread called on spin weight, and that will let us get at the pause instruction. It stops speculative execution, it causes the CPU to relax, and you use less energy. We also have this major problem in our code. And so part of this Almdahl's law is we can do stuff in parallel. There's lots we can do in parallel. But even on our single threads and our instruction streams, we've got this problem called data-dependent loads. As we go to memory, the cost to go to memory is expensive. Our memory subsystems are fast. They can go in parallel. The problem is you can't go in parallel whenever the next instruction you do is dependent on the value before. You have a data dependency. We have to break that. How do we break that in our data structures? We need to start looking at things like having aggregate objects on the heap. We need to look at using value objects on the stack. So these are, has to become a, a fundamental thing. We also have issues for copying. I've discovered that if you're dealing with the latest C uh, mem copy versions, they can copy com sometimes like 20x faster inside the same process than Java can when you're dealing within the cache subsystem. And kind of last but not least, and it's probably the most important thing is, the queue interface itself is broken. It's got conflated concerns. API design is probably the most important thing you can do for performance. And don't conflate concerns. And what do I mean by conflated concerns in this case? Offer to a queue conflates the concerns of can I offer and is the queue full? That 
restricts how the algorithms are implemented inside. It's a real issue. It's the same on the poll side. We need to break those apart, and when you break them apart, you can get a lot more performance. So very quickly in closing, Amazon are just about to release the X1 instances. We're talking two terabytes of RAM, hundreds of vCores. This stuff is going to become front and center in our lives, and we have to deal with it as we go parallel. So we just got to start caring about it much more at a lower level. Where can you find the code? The benchmarks I talked about are all up there. The different data structures are available in Agrona and Aron, so they're free to go and get that. And on that, I'll wrap up and finish. I think I might have no time or maybe one minute. Cool. So if anybody wants to grab me for a chat, catch me outside or whatever. Thank you all very much.